Hello, listeners, and welcome to this week's bonus episode of With Love, Victoria. I am joined by the Princess Beatrice, Grace Velasco. Hi, Grace. How are you? Hi, Rachel. I'm happy to be here. I'm good. How are you? I'm fabulous. I'm so glad to have you here. Um, You know, you and Kayla have kind of been the stars of this season, so it's so exciting to get to talk to you after, you know, a season of Princess Beatrice going on this exploratory journey of her mother's young life. So I'm excited to talk about season one, and I hope you're ready to dive in. Yeah. Oh, my God. What an honor. Thank you for having me. So let's just hop right in here uh, and talk about playing Princess Beatrice. Uh, Did you know anything about Princess Beatrice uh, before you took on the role? Oh, my God. Absolutely not, honestly. (laughs) Um, Truly, my knowledge of the British monarchy is so uh, untouched since high school (laughs) that revisiting this throughout this whole experience has been really, um, really interesting for me, especially the aspect that it hasn't been it actually, the history isn't that long ago. <laughs> so that was really interesting for me to find out. Well, that's what's so fascinating is, you know, when you think of Queen Elizabeth II, you know, who's the current monarch of England, you know, this is her great, great grandmother. Exactly. Oh, my God. The pieces really fall into place after this. Like Beatrice literally was alive uh, less than a century ago. It's insane how relevant this is. And also seems like it happened a billion years ago. Hit the nail on the head. (laughs) Um, And it's been such an honor to watch you uh, learn about Beatrice uh, as a historical figure, but also as a character that you've brought to life. Um, So I was introduced to you through Kayla. um, And I almost have to credit Kayla as the casting director for this show. (laughs) Because if I ever needed anybody, she was like, let me ask this person. Let me look into this. Let me look into this. And so she introduced me to you. um, And uh, you auditioned for me with the final song of the season with Rewritten. Um, and you would give me this lovely rendition that I was like, oh, she, she'll be lovely uh, to play Princess Beatrice. But, you know, after months and months of recording and, you know, you did every episode as Beatrice, you a few weeks ago sent me the recording of Rewritten for the show. And seeing how much you had grown in the character and your performance of her, now that you understood her, you were confident. I was almost emotional. Oh, oh my God, me too. It was it was like night and day, honestly. I mean, the material itself kind of spoke to where Beatrice is at at that point of the show, which I now know is the end of the season. And it's a huge kind of like 11 o'clock moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, when you when you really put it into context, it's it's kind of heartbreaking what what she's realizing about the life of her mother and, and the impression she's left on her children and what that means for Beatrice's duty as the editor of all of these journals. It's, it's, it's a lot to process for sure. Well, so let's talk a little bit about Beatrice as uh, a character because she has this very interesting position in our show of rewriting history. And she's definitely a protagonist. I wouldn't call her an antagonist by any means, but she is definitely doing this controversial um, task that her mother has set her to. So how did you approach Beatrice in uh, performing her, in justifying her actions? Uh, Talk a little bit about that journey. Sure. I mean, first and foremost, um, you know, getting the scripts, I'm I'm doing all of my scenes with Connor Delves, who's, Connor is the best, like literally the best. Um, I'm approaching it as, as bare bones as possible with, without the knowledge of history at first, right? It's, it's, Beatrice and her brother, Bertie, who are arguing about the legacy and um, kind of what to include in these journals or not from a standpoint of siblings and people that have processed the experience of their lives so differently. And, you know, Beatrice and I have a lot of common ground being the youngest. (laughs) (laughs) And I kind of approached that with my own experience being the youngest child. And having arguments with older siblings, as she does in the show, about about remembering memories differently than they actually occurred and and watching that unfold for her and figuring out, oh, things are really not as as sugarcoated as I made them. And maybe I am not always right 
about what good things were happening or not, you know, and how our mother treated us this entire time, you know, the awakening is, is all of it for me, really. Well, and talking about this dynamic between siblings in the show, this show has been just the the show of amazing duos because um, Kayla and Jonathan were an amazing duo and Kayla and Colton were an amazing duo in their scenes. And then you and Connor, you guys found this amazing sibling dynamic almost right away. You really dove headfirst into that uh, tete-a-tete, sibling first, royals second kind of idea. You honored the human parts of these people. Yeah, I thought it was really important to do so. I mean, I'm thinking of, in specific, in particular, in episode three, I forget where exactly it is, but I think Birdie has this line where he's like, and to think all she left me was an empire. I was looking at this the other day and I was like, that's really, that really encapsulates the whole essence of what's going on with them. It's like, the really big honor in their relationship is the journals, not, not Bertie being a Royal, <laughs> not, not being in charge of everything. It's really, it's really what is left of, of honoring Victoria. <laughs> and um, I think that's what really makes it translate into a great musical podcast is, is the aspect of siblings, not just the Royals. Well, and something interesting about Beatrice when I was doing research was that Princess Beatrice both in our show and in reality, she's almost a secret protagonist in the narrative of Queen Victoria. Because in doing research about Queen Victoria, I saw the phrase come up in her diaries, edited by her youngest daughter, Beatrice, Mm -hmm. in her diaries, edited by her youngest daughter, Beatrice. Well, her youngest daughter, Beatrice, edited her diaries and it said this. That sentence came up so many times in different places Mm. with no explanation. And I kept feeling like there was this mystery that hadn't been answered. And so when I was writing this show and I decided to use this as the framework, I think Beatrice actually kind of demanded for this to be her story. Right. Absolutely. I think so too. There's such a huge journey between, um, the perceptions of the diaries, right? It's, it's all perfect in the beginning. And then by the end of season one, there's so much to be decided, like whether or not she should continue with this because she didn't know the whole truth the entire time. Cause she, she refused to use any other family member as a, as a means to understand the whole picture. Well, and something that has always been really interesting about what the real Princess Beatrice did in editing these diaries is she kind of took out anything she thought was improper and she put a lot of thought into her work. But something I wonder if it occurred to her, it must have, was that other people had diaries and (laughs) other people had written about these events that she was erasing. And that's mostly how we know today about things that she took out is by what's left in other people's diaries. I really don't think she thought of anyone else. I think that there was like a very, um, not, not to be, you know, no shade to Beatrice, you know, she, (laughs) (laughs) but you know, I think in a lot of moments in the season, she, she's blatantly ripping up entire scenarios, you know, whether it be like, um, things that happened with Birdie when he's a child that she didn't like, and she wasn't aware of, or like, between Victoria and Albert's fight, she rips those up completely. She just doesn't think anyone has the duty to recall these things. And it it, it makes her a little bit of a martyr. Um, I, I, I'm trying to figure out a way to make that sound as non-judgmental as possible. But I just think that her, her duty to her mother was so... Um, it was put on such a large pedestal, she didn't consider anyone else's um, ability to recount it historically. Well, something that arises out of the very strange situation that she lived in and that all of the royals were in is this idea of providence and a heavenly right to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Um, And kind of every royal has a different view on what that means. But I, I think for Beatrice, who didn't have a throne and didn't have any power, but was still a part of this grand scheme of a family held up by God 
her view was, okay, this is my contribution, my right, my providential right. Yes, exactly. It was, it was very specific. I mean, her duty to her mother was, was her life. Um, and that was it. Amen. <laughs> so let's talk about where we left Princess Beatrice at the end of this last episode. So she has lost her brother, Bertie. And your final song rewritten begins with him asking you how you're going to remember him. And you promise him to remember him as he was. So what do you think Beatrice's intent was at the beginning of that song? And talk about how, where she ends up. Ooh, that's that's a heavy moment. Um <laughs> I think that looking back at those couple scenes that happen right before the song, it's it's not disingenuous um, that she is looking for reconcile with Birdie. She's looking for um, some finality in in honoring that relationship that was not perfect, but ultimately they could really understand each other. And when she says, "I promise to remember you as you were." I think she really means it. But then throughout the rest of the song, she is kind of exploring and honoring what she's already been up to the entire season, right? She has this style of embellishing and sugarcoating all of the diaries, but then also I think she's kind of making a turn and she's looking forward to ways she can be a lot more honest and transparent in the diaries, I would say. What's interesting is you spent so much of this season with Connor, only with Connor. And Connor is not leaving the show now that he's dead. Uh, he just gets to go back in time. So he gets to start recording with everybody back in the past. And you, uh, you're you left by your lonesome. I mean, you, you'll you get a new tete-a-tete character. I'm going to petition for you to make um, the ghost of Birdie. To, to continue along with me. So, so Connor can come back and work with me, please. <laughs> the ghost of Birdie, just him going, boo, don't take out that line. Yeah. Honestly, I need Connor. I need him. I felt bad at the beginning of the season because the early episodes of Birdie and Beatrice are very much setting up who Queen Victoria was. Because to in order to be able to learn things about Princess Beatrice, you need to know a certain amount about who Queen Victoria was. And so episodes one through three, you got to do a lot of scenes that were very plot devicey, very set up, very like, Beatrice, don't do this. Bertie, I'm going to do this. And it was kind of that back and forth. <laughs> that was a really good impression. <laughs> Thank you. I, I don't know why I didn't cast myself. I'm just perfect for the role. I basically don't need you. I could play all the roles. Um, Missed opportunity. No, not at all. Please don't leave me. <laughs> I'm here. Um, but when you guys finally got to do some of the meteor stuff, it was so heart-wrenching. And episode six, where is your Tony Award? Oh my God. Um, because you and Connor in episode six got – Three really beautiful scenes in a row, but the death scene specifically of Birdie, or as he is dying, I don't think he dies right there in this scene, but it was so gentle, so beautiful, and I was jealous I didn't get to see it live. But I also just can't believe the capacity in which we were able to make that happen. You know, it's it's we're not seeing each other face to face. We're totally live over microphones. You're literally on the other side of the world. That's insane. I mean, that's really magical. You both also took on the monumentous task of playing people 30 years older than you. Oh, God. But I'm used to it, though. I'm always like that theater actor that's like, oh, just wait till you can be the mom or whatever, you know. I definitely relate to that. I think everything in my vocal range is uh, very nicely set in the 40-year-old mom range as well. So <laughs> living that mom life. But both of you do it with esteem and talent. Do you consider what she has destroyed of Queen Victoria's diaries a great tragedy? Or how do you view the work that she did as a modern day audience member looking at the show and not as someone who's gotten to fall in love and portray Beatrice? I honestly 
thinking of how you asked me that right now, I and and if I was in an audience watching this happen in front of me without knowing, I would kind of be frustrated with her. I mean, maybe that's not the right answer, but <laughs> I you're watching all of these wonderful live scenes full of life with like Kayla and all of the different characters in Queen Victoria's life and then immediately you get the the moment when Beatrice rewrites it or or how what she has to say about it and it's not exactly what happened so the immediate dissatisfaction with that would be um I mean it would be joyful to watch because it's interesting but also for history's sake you'd be like all right I see why this is a problem and I'm really curious what she's going to do next Beatrice is certainly a historical character that is hard to decide exactly what you think of her and as a character that I had to write it was difficult for me to decide exactly how I was planning on portraying her and what I wanted the audience to leave thinking about her right which is one of the most important things you can do when preparing to write a character so it was something I really had to think about a lot because I didn't want to get I didn't want to give off this wishy-washy half woman uh, where I was like, well, what she's doing is not great, but, you know, she shouldn't be unlikable. Like, and so then she's just nothing at all. Uh, Yeah, I think her mission statement is really strong. You know, she wants to make people believe that that her mother's life was was beautiful and it wasn't ugly and she always made the right decision and she treated her family well equally with respect and all of this she has the rose colored glasses this is very clear and it's it's not it's not always the right thing and i think a lot of people can relate to that but also condemn that so it's it's there's a lot to unpack well here's a fun fact about the writing of the show that you may not know but you were bringing up her mission statement uh the very first thing that you sing in the show in the first episode is oh my duty i will do to my kingdom and to you Mm -hmm. um that was supposed to be a, a song for queen victoria there was originally a song in the show where Queen Victoria addressed the Privy Council and she said that was how the song started. Uh, and it, those were Queen Victoria's words about providence and about intention and her mission as queen. And I think it kind of goes back to what we were talking about previously, about how Beatrice had to find her own providential role in this family of grandiose romantic ideals and it almost seems very fitting that this song that was meant for a queen ended up starting your journey as Beatrice 100 percent. Grace is there anything you would like to talk about about Princess Beatrice before we start wrapping things up anything that you any questions you had about her that you never asked and now want to ask live here in public who I mean the whole show is so centric on her editing of the diaries, but I know that she is a really beloved figure in history, and I would love to kind of reflect on her her other accolades and legacy aside from being the Queen's secretary, if you could speak to that a little bit. Oh, absolutely. Uh, she was a mother. She was a wife. She, much like Queen Victoria, was a a romantic. She was a woman very much of her time in that she wanted to be a mother. She wanted that domestic life that her mother idealized. Um, And in many ways, I think... It's interesting you say, can I speak to something other than her being the queen's secretary? But she was so primed into being her mother's librarian in her life that it, I think it almost became synonymous with who she was. But she was also someone who was tragically struck by loss, much like her mother. She lost a son in World War I after having lost her husband at a young age uh and then i believe i believe she ended up losing another son in her lifetime right Ugh, 
God. And so I think it almost makes too much sense that she ended up not only becoming her mother's secretary, but became this woman who spent all of her later years living in the past. She outlived basically everyone. (laughs) Beatrice lived from 1857 to 1944. She died at 87 years old. Mm -hmm. Her son, Leopold, not to be confused with Queen Victoria's son, Leopold, who also Mm -hmm. died young. Um, Beatrice's son, Leopold, died in 1922 at the age of 32. And then her favorite son, Maurice, died uh, in 1914 at the age of 23. Um, And her husband died in 1896 at the age of 37. That is a lot of loss. Yeah. And it's, it's always shocking to me how... And as humans, we always are looking for patterns, but it is shocking to me how you can kind of put her life next to Queen Victoria's life. And there are just so many things, the loss of a beloved spouse, the loss of children, this kind of aimlessness, even though they had very clear roles. Right, 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 right. So I think she's a fascinating historical figure and I'm... So glad that I have gotten to learn about her so intimately, and I'm so glad that you brought her to life so beautifully. Thank you, Rachel. I feel the same. I know I like I have so much respect for her and respect for everyone that's worked on this. It's just insane how it was able to happen. And I'm so thankful to Kayla for getting me on board. But yeah, everything just fell into place so perfectly to do this, and I'm so happy to continue it and Also revisit for season two. Ah. Season two, baby. Uh, Where you get to act with more than just one person. Like I said, if it's just Connor, I will not be mad. (laughs) All right. Well, Grace, where can we find you on the interwebs? Where can we follow you? How can we stalk you? Oh, yes. Stalking. Uh, Sounds great. My Instagram is at Grace Velasco. Uh, my website's www.gracefulasco.com. You know, have kind of a unique little last name. Hopefully you don't find another Grace Velasco I don't know about. <laughs> You're the only one. She's one of a kind, folks. Oh my gosh. <laughs> you don't have to put any letters in your middle name to join Equity. <laughs> wow. Thank goodness for that. Thank goodness for that. And... If you would like to follow with Love Victoria and keep up with us as we move towards season two, you can follow us on Instagram at With Love Victoria Musical. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel, Ticking Clock Theater, where you can hear every episode of season one of With Love Victoria and eagerly await season two and perhaps get some extra bonus content while you're waiting for the story to unfold. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Uh, Please rate, subscribe, tell your friends on all the platforms, and we hope to see all of your lovely faces for season two. Thank you, Grace. Bye, everyone. Bye, Rachel. Thank you so much.